Before viewing video lessons, it is important to read the textbook using the learning guide as your turn-by-turn -turn directions. Then use the learning guide to take organized notes in your own words with examples and pictures. Variations in Consciousness. In this chapter, we will continue to look at the biopsychosocial model of human behavior but we will look at the interaction between biological, psychological, and socio-environmental factors. Psychological factors include consciousness, behavior, emotions, and thoughts. The biological factors we'll be looking at are brain waves, the circadian rhythm, hormones, age, chemicals such as drugs, and disease. And lastly, the social and environmental factors we will look at are signals of light and dark from the environment, stimuli in the bedroom, and culture. We will begin by looking at the nature of consciousness. Consciousness has been a part of the study of psychology since it was founded by Wilhelm Bundt in 1879. In psychology, we define consciousness as your personal awareness of external stimuli, what you can personally see, hear, smell, taste, and touch right now in this moment, internal stimuli such as internal sensations, are you hungry, do you need to go to the bathroom, those sorts of things, and also your thoughts. What are you thinking about right now in this moment? Consciousness also includes your sense of self or awareness of self. Now one of the things we've discovered about consciousness is you don't have um, complete awareness of all stimuli at all times. Instead, as Williams, William James found, our consciousness ebbs and flows like a stream. This means that right now in this moment, your senses are being bombarded with information about the sight, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches, but you may not be fully conscious or aware of all of those sensations. So I may not be aware of the temperature in the room I'm in unless it's extremely cold or hot. I might not be aware of the smell unless there's something unusual or remarkable. So our consciousness can ebb and flow, both our awareness of external, internal, and self. Now, William James, if you remember him from chapter one, he was the functionalist who liked to test people. He came up with this concept of the stream of consciousness. Um, after William James, Freud, somebody else we learned about in the first chapter, proposed the concept of the unconscious. So he said, if you can be conscious of something, then you need to have the opposite or the unconscious. And according to Freud, things that we are not aware of or are unconscious of have a big influence on our behavior. We, out, we like to use the example of an iceberg where you only see a small portion of the iceberg and most of the rest of it is below the surface. Freud said that we were like this. Most of our behavior was driven by the unconscious below the surface, and only a tiny part of us is actually conscious. Today, we still study consciousness with sleep and dreaming research and using an EEG. EEG stands for electro encephalograph. Electro, looking at electricity. Cephalo, meaning head. And graph. So we're looking at electrical activity going on inside the head or brain. So we can put a sensor on the outside of your skull and it can monitor the electrical activity going on in the brain. And when we graph the, this activity, what we see are waves and we can measure the amplitude or height of the waves, and we can also measure the frequency or the cycles per second, how often does the wave go up and down. 
Using EEGs, we've actually discovered four distinctive patterns of consciousness. Right now, hopefully, everyone listening to the video is in beta. The beta brainwave pattern is associated with normal waking thought, alert problem solving. This is also the style of brainwaves you have when you're learning. If you're not in alpha, you can't, or if you're not in beta, you can't learn. So in order to really learn, you have to be very focused and alert. The other type of brain waves that you can have while you're awake are alpha brain waves. And these are the types of waves that you have when you're relaxed or maybe you have that blank mind. I always think about sitting in a classroom. Most of the class I'm awake and I'm focused, I'm alert and paying attention. But I remember as a student sometimes my mind would just kind of go blank and I would miss what the instructor said and then I'd have to sort of catch myself up after that. And so that's kind of the alpha waves. You would think that we would spend a lot of our day in beta, our waking day in beta, but it turns out a lot of our waking day is actually spent in alpha, and that's because alpha is the autopilot mode, and our brain tries to be as efficient as possible and move as many tasks as it can to autopilot, or I can do this without really thinking about it. Think about things like tying your shoes. You don't really have to concentrate too hard to do that. Or brushing your teeth. <clears throat> Even driving home along a familiar route can be done in alpha. So if you've ever driven home from uh, work or some place that you go quite frequently and gotten home and thought, I have no memory of my drive. It's because you were driving in alpha. The two other types of brain waves that we see are associated with sleep. Theta brain waves are light sleep, and delta brain waves is deep, sometimes called deep slow wave sleep. So we want to look at how biological rhythms affect our states of consciousness to include sleep. The biological rhythm that we focus on related to sleep is the circadian rhythm. It's a roughly 24-hour biological cycle tied to the environmental cycles of light and dark or night and day. And we find that this circadian rhythm regulates our sleepiness and alertness, and it also affects our body temperature and our hormone levels. If you look at this particular graphic, this is data collected from an adult. Children have different patterns, but this is an adult. And what you'll see is that while we're sleeping, we tend to not be very alert. And that when adults first wake up in the morning, it takes us a little while to get going. And our alertness increases over the course of the morning into the afternoon, and then it starts to wane into the evening hours. Children actually have a different pattern than this. Um, children can go from kind of zero to 60 in one second. So they can go from asleep and then all of a sudden to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And this is a pattern you might notice if you have kids. You can also see how the body temperature changes. It lowers when we're asleep. It raises during the day. Another thing that you will notice is the secretion of human growth hormone. We get little bits of that during the day, but we get a big shot of it fairly soon after we fall asleep. And this is very important, even though as an adult this person has stopped growing, they need human growth hormone to help them repair the damage done to their body each day. So let's take a look at how we can set this biological clock. I mentioned that the circadian rhythm was tied to cycles of light and dark. So what happens is the retina is going to register the light levels. The retina is at the back of the eye. That sends a signal up to the hypothalamus. And then the hypothalamus, remember, one of its functions is to control the endocrine system and the autonomic nervous system. The hypothalamus is going to tell the pineal gland if it's night or day. 
if it is nighttime, then the pineal gland will secrete melatonin. If it is daytime and brightly lit, then the melatonin is decreased. And this is essentially what regulates our circadian rhythm. Unfortunately, we don't live in a world where we are intimately tied to the rising and setting of the sun. We can make things light or dark at all different times of day. And so what we find is that these kinds of things can mess up your circadian rhythm. So people who work shift work, who work at times when we would normally be sleeping, uh, people who travel across time zones can experience jet lag, and then we also have people who kind of stay up late and have the lights on or are using cell phones or computers that are emitting light. And then we have people who sleep in and pull the shutters and keep the world kind of artificially dark. All of those things can mess up this circadian rhythm. It's best if this clock can stick to a really consistent 24-hour cycle, but when we kind of make it go back and forth and back and forth, that can create problems with our circadian rhythm. The types of problems you can have if your circadian rhythm is out of sync are poor sleep, feeling really low energy, fatigued and sluggish. You can be irritable. Think about it. Do you want to spend a lot of time with somebody who's not sleeping well? They tend to be a little grouchy. They can also have cognitive deficits. Cognitive has to do with thinking and memory and problem solving. Deficit, of course, means that you are um, low in that particular capability. So when your circadian rhythm is out of sync, you can't think straight. There's also a relationship with calorie intake and weight. This one's a little bit complicated. We don't know if somebody's weight goes up and that affects their sleep and turning affecting their circadian rhythm, or if the circadian rhythm got out of sync first and that affected the weight. I think in some cases it's one way and in some cases it's the other way. But we do know that the circadian rhythm is associated with uh, being out of sync is associated with increased caloric intake and weight. We also see a higher incidence of all kinds of physical diseases to include cancer, diabetes, ulcers, high blood pressure, and heart disease. When your circadian rhythm is out of sync, everything's out of sync.